Hi, welcome back to our Bible study, our devotional on um, Purpose Driven Life. We are on the last purpose, purpose number five. You were made for a mission. So that's kind of our concluding section that we've got for you today. And um, it's quite the, the wrap up. There's a lot of like things that we've kind of heard before, some things, themes that are coming back in this last section of the book. Uh, so some, some of my kind of just initial thoughts, I think that talking about mission from a Lutheran perspective is kind of a good thing to, to highlight during this. I think that what I struggled with with a lot of Rick's writing throughout this section is that it kind of felt very guilt and shame based. Mm. And this idea that, you know, people will burn in hell or, or suffer eternally because of their wickedness if we don't go out and and save them. Um, I kind of struggled with that theology a little bit. I don't know how you guys want to talk about that, but it's a huge theme, I think, for this whole section that we should probably delve into. So, Yeah, there, there's a particular point where where Rick says something to that effect of like, if if we don't save them, who will? And I'm like, Jesus, like Jesus does the saving. Like you told me that earlier, Rick. I don't know where we lost it along with this. Um, and I think, you know, the, yeah, in my understanding of mission, I, I'm glad that there is a section in this book about mission because it is a, a purpose of our life, our life as Christians, our life of faith. And I like kind of how he talks about um, that ministry is the work you do within the church and then mission is the work you do outside the church for the sake of the world. And I think both are really important. Um, and, and certainly from a Lutheran context, the way that I would put it is to say that because God does the saving, right? Because of God's grace as a reality in our life, it's then um, out of, in recognition of that grace, in response to that grace that we go out to serve the world and to spread the good news. And so it's just kind of like, an ordering and a sequencing thing that I think Rick and I would differ on, but it's really important to me to say like, it starts with God's grace and then as a reaction and a response to it, that's where mission and ministry frankly comes from. Gary, what do you think about all this? I would say that as I looked through and read this passage, part of it was a little challenging to me again, I think because just of what Rachel was, was raising, some parts of it, rubbed against my Lutheran theological framework and all of that. But I do like exactly that idea that that mission is important and understanding maybe the fact that our mission field might be as close as our next door neighbor and as far away as Malaysia. To to be able to understand all of that in a context, but realizing that uh, you know, as, as we study this book now, we have people confined in, in homes, and our mission is a phone call at times right now. That, that might be the most important thing that we do, and it may not be, like you might say, quote, saving one more for Jesus as a part of that. It simply might be edifying the fact that God is still active in our lives and in the world that's far more important for people to hear in these days. So, I mean, Rick was writing this maybe in a different context and probably writing it for his own church where he was trying to drum up people to go on the mission trips that Saddleback was planning. I almost got a feeling like it was um, um, more a commercial for what was going on in his church than a true uh, understanding of what would happen kind of across the board. So I think we just have to translate for ourselves and understand that important aspect of mission for our life and what it means at our comfort level in understanding what the results of that will be. Yeah, one of the things I'll say too, like in regards to the, the short-term mission trips, because he actually spends a decent amount of time on the importance of that. And, and I have gone back and forth on my opinions on short-term mission trips, but as I reflect on it, I went on a several growing up in the church and they were powerful formative experiences. And, and it's on page 302 in my book, but this is all a part of chapter, what chapter is this, 38, um, where he talks about going on a mission trip will enlarge your heart, expand your vision, stretch your faith, deepen your compassion, and fill you with a kind of joy you never experienced. And what I actually like about that is that he's contextualizing these short-term mission projects in terms of the ways that they infect the individuals going on the trip. And, and I think that that's Part of one of the key ways of understanding it is that oftentimes 
the work you're doing in these other places may not be that important or impactful, but the experience itself can be deeply formative and important for the individual participating in it. And, and see, and this kind of reflects why I have some back and forth on the importance of short-term mission trips. Um, but I do recognize from personal experience, like it was a powerful, powerful opportunity that I had on a number of occasions. And, and I wouldn't trade it for anything, although maybe I would have done it a little differently in some circumstances. Yeah, I, you know, the problem I, I tend to have a lot of with short term mission trips is I think sometimes we can forget that God is already active in that place. God is already working. God is already there and God has a purpose there and that it's not us bringing God to that place. I think sometimes we, we think, ah, I am doing this mission for God and I'm bringing God to the whoever, you know, and it's a very, it's a definite place of privilege. And we kind of touched on this before starting the video, but I think that that's so huge. This mindset that, oh, I'm bringing God to this godless place. And that's not true. It's a very dangerous thinking. And God is already active. God is already working and um, creating a new vision and already doing mission in all these places. And a lot of times, as you say, Nate, it's how we're changed through that process more so than the people we're serving, you know. And I just want to give a, a shout out to um, many of our Lutheran organizations, um, right? Lutheran World Relief, Lutheran Refu Refugee Services, Lutheran, Lutheran Social Services. A lot of these organizations get a whole bunch of um, accolades because they're really good at sustained work in different regions. And these are often the organizations that stick around long term to see long term change take place in an area. I know in particular like Lutheran World Relief got a lot of awards because of the work they did in New Orleans following Hurricane Katrina because they were there for years and years and years. It wasn't just a quick come in and come out to feel better about yourself. It was sustained mission in that place. And so, I, I mean, I think it just lives at, like that's our lived theology in a lot of ways too, is this idea of accompaniment and being with people just as um, God came down from heaven to be with us in the person of Jesus, right? It all kind of links together on this. And maybe that takes us into how we understand ourselves and of course um, you know Rick has a chapter in here talking about being a world-class Christian which uh, seems less less humble than he talks about in other parts of the uh, of the book if we would if we would consider it that way but I do think he's trying for a, to, to help us understand that taking on the characteristics of Jesus are important for us and, and how we live that out can really make a difference for ourselves. Um, but most of us have probably realized that coming at that with an approach of humbleness makes us feel more godly than to, to make ourselves feel like we finally have achieved some really high attainable goal and that we are now a role model for others. Yeah, and I'll, um, that world class Christian chapter, what I did like about it, and I think I mentioned this in the last video, is he talks, you know, each section is about shifting your mindset from thinking like this to thinking like that. And I'm just reminded of the, the passage in 1 Corinthians. I mentioned this last time. Yeah, yeah, about the be not conformed to the ways of the world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. So often I do think that that's just part of our Christian faith is shifting our mindset and the way we think first and foremost and then allowing that to, to change our actions and our behaviors in the world. And for what it's worth, right, that chapter does kind of highlight and under, underscore that, um, that type of approach. Absolutely, it's, it's that idea that we've talked about at Bethany that was our theme for the year, uh, that abundant thinking versus scarcity thinking, not getting caught up in what we can't do and what we don't have, but thinking about the resources we do have, the gifts and passions that we do possess and how God is already at work in, in this place. So I think, yeah, I, I agree. I think that that was very powerful. As we move uh, further into the book then at chapter 39, he talks about balancing your life. And a lot of that is that understanding that it's hard sometimes to feel like you're in this all, all by yourself 
So I do like that aspect of finding a small group where you can, you can vet some of this. You can get true and honest feedback from others. I think that's always good for us. And I'm always impressed with the small group opportunities that Bethany has, where people can think things through, think them out, but most importantly, that they can still, uh, they can come in with an open mind and say, I don't have all this figured out. But the shared experiences, uh, I think, are what's more fundamental than anything else. And of course, Rick talks about for those you know, for whom jour journaling works, doing that, keeping a little journal and, and having some of that so you can go back and see progress you've made. For some people, that's going to be really valuable information to have. And, and it's a really good way to start. But, but most importantly, I would say is when you're in those small groups, the open mind and the free conversation are what's going to help all of us grow. Yeah. And I mean, I even experienced that through God's word for the week right, with our, our weekly Bible study where we look at the texts coming up for Sunday. And it's just, you know, the pastoral staff kind of prepares and does some of the additional research ahead of time. But it's amazing how reading scripture together always opens new doors and possibilities. Because a person's life experience totally affects the way they read a certain passage, and they're going to see things that you never will. And so um, I, I just, I think studying scripture together in community is essentially important for that reason because it breaks you out of your one way of looking at things which is valuable and important but it's a good reminder that God is working through a variety of different pathways and channels and yeah it's just so rich when you get together to talk through things in that way with an open mind learning from each other's experiences and viewpoints. And I think now is a great opportunity to rediscover the balance in our lives and in our faith. Um, you know, everything feels kind of shaken up and different and our routines are different. Our work-life balance is getting kind of shaken up a little bit and um, we can use this time, I think, as an opportunity to reach out to others in new ways and rediscover our faith in new ways and take time for peace and quiet and uh, mindfulness, centering yourself and I think there are opportunities to rediscover balance right now that I think can lead us into the future with a healthier mindset. So I, I know that I've kind of found that in my own life right now, so. And then finally, we look at Rick's 40th day as he talks in there um, about, you know, creating that life statement for yourself, your purpose statement or your mission statement, however you would want to say that. He gives some examples there about, you know, my life purpose is to um, do certain things. Uh, as I looked over those, I, I thought they all looked very similar. Uh, um, and, uh, you know, I think he was kind of telegraphing to people, here is a good way to do this. But what I have found from my own life is that I don't know that I have a life purpose. Uh, there are some times where I have a year's purpose, there are some times where I might have had a multi-year purpose. Sometimes I'm lucky if I have a month's purpose or a week's purpose and, and, not, and not have that equated with a task list, but really just equated with where is my life with God and with the fellowship of people around me, whether, whether you would call them believers or not, but just what am I called to do in this time and in this place and so for me, I, I'm not sure I would ever land on a life purpose that I thought would become stagnant or that I would go back to and remind myself. I hope for me that would continue to be something that grows because I'll continue to grow. Yeah, I'm, I'm with you on that too. Of that, It just seems, well, I mean, I, I really resonate with um, the idea of seasons and that, right, like God kind of works in our life through different seasonal ways. And sometimes those are repetitive, you know, just like our liturgical calendar is a circle. And, you know, it seems like I have a life's purpose that kind of comes up the same time every year. And then other things that vary and ebb and flow. But I mean, there is, I wouldn't have, if I was writing this book, which I never would, um, <laughs> I would have not talked about it in terms of living with a purpose, but maybe living more so, um, with a grounded identity. That's always been far more powerful for me of like understanding my child of God nature, 
owning that and living in light of uh, of that identity um, has just for, for me personally been much more powerful than trying to hone in on a specific purpose because I do think that that changes so so quickly and so drastically um, and yet all of the various purposes I've sought after have all fallen within this realm of my child of God identity and God kind of calling me forth from that place. I think that's that's really powerful and I you know, I'm always kind of asking myself, what is, what is God, you know, requiring of me now? And where is God working in my life now? And how do I become more in tune with God's purpose? Because I think sometimes my own purpose for myself can be one thing and I can lose sight of where God is wanting me to be. And so how do we kind of make our purposes align? And, and I think Rick talks about that throughout this chapter. And, um, yeah, I think that's, I think that's kind of the goal is to, to kind of align our passions, our gifts, our hopes, um, our visions, but also make sure that it's lining up with God's vision for us too, and finding where those things coalesce, so to speak. I think you gave a pretty good summary of the book as a whole there, Rachel, just in, in, in how we would carry that out. One of the things that I did appreciate in this last section was Rick mentioned that he has taken a lot of Bible verses. I think a lot of times he's scoured through different translations to find the verse that kind of fits his purpose as a part of that. But he did talk about going back and reading Bible stories. Um, it's very difficult to take a passage and create an identity around it without knowing who said it, why they said it, whom they said it to, and what was the, what was the way that, that was happening in their world at the time. So I appreciate that Rick said, get into these Bible stories because, because they'll always do more for us. And I think that's an important part of us going forward. So we hope you enjoyed Purpose Driven Life. In some ways, we hope you didn't agree with everything in the book because we certainly didn't. And, uh, and, and as Christians, that's, that's part of our role is to delve deeper and, and to be very, very thoughtful about all of this and, and how that moves us forward. And so there are going to be more studies to come. Some of the things that we'll do in other books that we're looking at that we can, uh, that we can share together are ways that we'll continue to find ourselves growing. If, uh, if there's ways in there that uh, you, you, you were kind of finding a new part of your life in this purpose, that, that we have absolutely hope was your result as, um, again, it is ours anytime we delve deeply into literature and especially as we delve into scripture. So thanks for being a part of this adventure with us along the way. If nothing else during these days, it gave us a reason to actually put on decent clothes and comb our hair uh, when we knew we were coming to you on this Zoom. So uh, with that, uh, blessings as you continue to live a life of knowing God's love, abiding in you, and the ways that you can make that love known for the world. Bye, everybody. Bye.